yes, I'm glad people get to watch it. Hey, class. Okay, so we are going to try to get through Romans 7 today. It's it's a tall task. Okay, but we're going to do the best that we can with the time that we have. Um, and next week I'm going to hand out more materials and stuff for you all and give you some recommendations on good resources so that you can continue in your own study. Also, come over to my house. Hey, come over to my house. Um, you know, anytime I'm going to be a lot more freed up to have people over. And what I really love is discipleship and sitting down one-on-one -on -one and talking about the scriptures and talking about the Christian life. And so you may have questions. Um, I know that in the first class, there were definitely questions at the end. Um, and some of your questions will be answered next week. But for the ones that aren't, come hang out with me. <laughs> I will talk about them. Um, now, Romans 6 was all about our freedom from sin. And we know that we've been set free from sin because of our union with Christ. Okay, because we've been baptized into him, we've been placed into him, we've been united with him, we've also been united with him in his death and in his resurrection. Okay, and the slavery, the servitude to sin that we inherited from Adam, being a part of his race, we died out of that slave-master relationship that sin had with us. Okay, and so now sin has no claim on us. It has no authority over us. It has no power to control us any longer. We are legally set free from sin. Okay, that we saw in Romans 6 does not mean that we can't still choose sin. Okay, we can still choose sin. And um, he talks about in the second half um, <clears throat> that when we choose sin, we're choosing bondage. We're choosing to place ourselves back under that bondage and that servitude to sin that was ours in Adam. So the reason he starts talking about that is that he says this statement in verse 14 of chapter 6. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, I told you that this was the subject of chapter 7, and so we weren't really discussing it when we went through Romans 6. But what happens in Romans 6 is he talks about our union with Christ, okay, and he talks about us being able to share in his resurrection, in his life, and... Then he says that sin will not have dominion over us because we're not under law, but under grace. And then he kind of takes a step back from that statement to answer an obje objection okay, that he thinks will come from that statement that we're not under the law. And he asks what an objector might ask. What then shall we sin or shall we commit sinful acts because we're not under the law, but under grace. Okay, so a lot of times the people, what our reaction, okay, as humans is to hearing we're not under the law is, that, sound, that sounds like bad doctrine, <laughs> okay, right? That, that doesn't sound right, um, that you're saying we're not under the law, Paul. Are you saying that we're free to choose a sin now? We're we free to choose sinful acts? And he says the very emphatic, certainly not, or the heck no, right, as I like to say. Um, and he says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey. So he says you're choosing bondage if you choose to sin. You are not under the law, um, but that doesn't mean that you should just feel free to choose sin and to commit acts of sin. He's saying that doesn't make any sense. It, it's not compatible with who you are now, for one thing. And it's choosing to put yourself back in that bondage and uh, under that wrath that we were talking about in Romans chapter 1 um, that you've been set free from. So it doesn't make sense. Okay, but now that he's talked about that issue and he's covered it, 
he's going to go back to talking about us being free from the law, okay, not being under law. So Romans 6, we're free from sin's control, sin slavery, and chapter 7, we're free from the law. Okay, now, this is maybe not a super familiar concept to you. If you were in my hermeneutics class, we talked about it some, okay, when we talked about dispensationalism and different things. And so you you know, okay, that we're not under the law, um, but you may not have heard a lot of teaching on it. I know the previous pastor that we had at this church never taught on it. Um, I don't know what his position was on it, but he never taught on it. And our pastor now here does um, does teach it. And I wasn't up there when he was talking about in First Timoth Timothy um, 1, using the law unlawfully, but I heard about it. <laughs> so, um, yes, he, he's talked about and taught on um, us not being under law. But for us as a church here, it's it's rather new doctrine that we're just now hearing. Now, I never knew that I was not under the law. I never um, understood those statements in scripture. I just thought it had to do with, I'm, I'm not saved by the law. Okay. I just thought that's what it had to do with um, because that's how a lot of people teach it. And that's how a lot of people interpret it. Um, but I didn't know about my freedom from the law. Um, I didn't understand Romans 7 until I went to Bible school. So it's okay <laughs> if this is a little bit unfamiliar to you. And one lady this morning in the morning class said, it's confusing. <laughs> okay, so if you've been used to living your Christian life a certain way, um, your whole Christian life, and you've been used to kind of having a law mentality, um, maybe it's confusing at first. And it was to me. Okay, but... Uh, what we want to do is is not get overwhelmed by this is kind of new. This is um, maybe a, a little bit theological sounding and a little bit complicated. We want to get past all that and say, what is the word of God saying? Because this is the key to my freedom. Okay, this is the key to my freedom from sin. It, I told you when you were in Romans chapter 6 that this is not the whole thing. Okay, this is not the whole thing of how we experience the victorious Christian life. Yes, we are free from sin, and we need to know that, but we also need to know our freedom from the law, and we need to know what's coming in chapter 8, which we're going to cover next week. <clears throat> so, um, it is not common in evangelical churches today, unfortunately, for people to teach this truth. They will teach that we're not under the law, but what they mean by that is that we are not under the law to be saved. But they still believe that we are under the law as a rule of life. Okay, And, and that is why um, a lot of people have the Ten Commandments up, right? Because they think, well, this will be helpful to us. Right, if we just can see the Ten Commandments, be reminded of what we should be doing, um, it'll help us to live more righteous lives. Um, it's why our our natural tendency towards law, okay, is why um, our devotionals are the way I've talked about them being, where you know the the whole thing boils down to how should you apply this to your life. And by that, they're meaning, how should you try to change, right? How should you try to change yourself? Um, the principle of law is this. I've handed everyone here out this paper here. And I don't know if you can read it, people, on the screen. But I'll read it. <clears throat> so, law. Okay, here we're talking about law as a principle, in Romans 7, he's going to be talking about the Mosaic Law specifically. Okay, but you're going to see as we go through further in Romans 7, the idea of law that he's getting at is his own self-effort or his willpower. Okay, the futility of self-dependence 
is, is what the second part of Romans chapter 7 is about. So law, the principle of law is man striving in the strength of his flesh or Adam to attain the righteousness that is demanded by God. Man striving in the strength of his flesh or in Adam to attain the righteousness that is demanded by God. Man's doing, doing, doing to win God's favor. Self-dependence, self-righteousness, and God-defiance. Now, you might read that last one and think, how is, how is being under the law, how is trying to follow the law God-defiance? Okay, well, for one thing, if God says you can't do something and then you say, but I'm going to try, that's God-defiance. <laughs> okay, but, but for a lot of people, they don't know that they can't right and and that was me um i thought that all i needed really now that i was a saved individual now that i had believed the gospel was to know what i should be doing okay so that i could change and so that i could improve okay so that i could do good things for god okay me performing for god or me trying to do righteousness for God. That's law. That's living under law. Whether you're looking specifically, you know, into your Old Testament to find it or not. Um, if you are trying to perform for God, if you're trying to do something for him, that's law. That's not grace. Okay. Um, grace, on the other hand, is man relying on God's provision, God's mercy, realizing his need and depending on Christ to produce righteousness in him. God's doing for me instead of my doing for him on the basis of favor freely given. And it says in the parentheses there, done. Okay, the work that Jesus did for us, as we talked about in Romans 6, is complete and is done. And us being placed in him and his death and resurrection is a complete and finished thing. Okay, even us being glorified is talked about in the past tense. We'll get to that today. In under grace, there's not the self-reliance or self-dependence. There's self-distrust. Okay, because I know that I can't do it, okay, because I do not trust myself to be able to carry it out, the righteousness that God requires. Um, I can't, I recognize my inability and I don't trust myself. It's self-judgment, recognizing my own sinfulness and inability, okay, of myself, in and of myself, to do anything that's truly righteous. And finally, God-dependence. Now, another way that law is God defiance is that God's revealed word, okay, he's revealed his will, okay, and his will for people in Christ, okay, men and women in Christ, new creations, is for them to not be under law, okay, and, and that's not just in Romans, okay, it's a huge theme of the book of Galatians as well, and Paul talks about it. Uh, in most of his epistles. So us not trying to follow the law, okay, us not trying to perform for God or do righteousness for him ourselves is his will, okay, his stated will. So if we are acting in opposition to his will, that is God defiance. Now, <clears throat> For a lot of people, again, it's not a knowing defiance of God's revealed will because they don't know it, right? They don't know his revealed will about this issue. And so they think me trying to do good for God, um, this is a good thing, right? That I'm trying to please him. And what this mentality leads to, um, I had an, a different teacher in Bible school who taught Christian life. His name was Thomas Freeman. Gotta give credit. 
So he talked about um, the law mentality is being like, he called it ladder life. Okay, so when you're, you know, performing well, outwardly, let's say, you feel like you're climbing the spiritual ladder, right? And, and when your performance is good and you feel like you're doing good for God, um, you feel closer to God, okay? You feel more acceptable to him. You feel um, more spiritual, right? You feel closer to being righteous, okay? You're getting there, okay? But then when inevitably you sin, okay, or you fall out, either outwardly you fall or God shows you your sin inwardly, okay? Because that's the stuff that's harder for us to see, um, that it's there. But when God shows you your sin, reveals it to you, or when you fail outwardly, you are just launched into utter despair and you feel like you fell off the ladder, right? And you're like, oh, woe is me. What is, what's wrong with me, right? And, and you get into this thinking of, I, I don't know, like, why isn't, why isn't this working? You know, my, why aren't my efforts to live righteously working? Uh, what's wrong with me that I can't do the things that I want to do for God? Why can't I keep it all together? Um, why do I keep failing in this area, even though I've committed this over to the Lord? Uh, whatever it may be. And, and we feel distant from God and we feel like we're not as accepted by him. Um, we're, we're disappointed in ourselves because we've been believing in ourselves, right? We've been trusting in ourselves to accomplish something that we thought we could do. Um, and this is law, okay? This is where law leads us. And we're going to see that it led Paul there too, okay? But God can use that too. Okay, God desires to use our failures, our failure in trying to keep the law, to bring us to a point where we know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. And so that we cry out finally, as Paul does at the end of Romans chapter 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Who will deliver me from the body of this death? But what God wants is not just for us to realize our inability, but to realize the provision that he has given us in Christ and to walk in it. Okay, so some of the provision in Christ, a lot of it we already talked about in Romans 6, um, but there's more coming in Romans chapter 8. So, again, this... This uh, ladder life, this law thing, that's not compatible with grace, right? Um, we've talked about, you know, previously in Romans that works and grace, they don't, they're mutually exclusive. They don't go together. They do not work together. Works and grace don't. So if I'm trying to work for God, then I'm not living by his grace. Okay, does that make sense? If I think I'm doing something for God, that's not grace, okay? That's works or that's law. That's me trying to perform righteousness before God. And God says that the law doesn't bring about righteousness in us. It can't, okay? And it's not because there's anything wrong with the law. It's because there's something wrong with me, <laughs> Okay, my, my flesh, who I am, I cannot do it, okay? I cannot carry it out. And so when I set out to do something for God and I'm living on that basis, my efforts will go nowhere. Using my willpower, okay, to try to perform and do for God is not honoring to God. Okay, I'm thinking I'm honoring God because I'm trying to do good for him. Okay, but it doesn't honor God 
because it's setting aside the grace of God. Okay, the grace of God is I have provided everything that you need. I have done it all. And so I get all the glory, right? And that's how it was in our justification. God didn't want us to try to do something to get it, right? God didn't want us to try um, to add something to the work that Christ already did. That's like spitting on the sacrifice of Christ, right? And saying that it's not enough. And it's the same way with our Christian life. God has done everything for us. He has provided everything that we need. All full and complete freedom from sin is ours. And we're going to see in Romans 8 that the resurrection life of Christ, his righteousness is available to us through the indwelling Holy Spirit all the time. So why are you trying to do it? <laughs> why are you trying to do it? If God has provided all of this for you in Christ because you can't, why are you going to turn around and say, but I can do it? Okay, now that is setting aside the grace of God. So we've talked about the verse Galatians 2.20. Okay, here and there, especially in, in uh, Romans chapter 6. And we're going to turn there real quick. Whenever I'm talking, I am like turning the wrong way in my Bible because I can't do two things at once. Okay, so Galatians 2 is actually in the context of talking about the law, okay? Um, it's actually in the context of talking about instead of living by the law, okay, living by faith. So he says in verse 19, for I through the law died to the law. That's what we're going to talk about in the beginning of Romans 7. I died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now, a lot of people separate that verse 21 out um, from the context and say this is talking about justification. But the context is sanctification. Okay? Sanctification, living by faith in Christ to carry it out, believing in my co crucifixion with him that has set me free. That is the grace of God, his provision for me. And so if I choose to live by the law, I'm setting aside the grace of God. And I am disagreeing with God and saying righteousness can come through the law. Okay, which is a big deal. Okay, because Christ died because righteousness couldn't come through the law. Okay, so we don't want to be saying that. We don't want to be making that error. <clears throat> Galatians is a quick read, and it'd be a really good one for you guys to read alongside Romans 6 through 8, um, because there's a lot of parallel truths. Now, where um, a lot of commentators and, and people tend to say that Galatians is all about justification by faith, um, truthfully, <laughs> it is not just about justification. It is about justification and sanctification, both being by faith and not by the law. So you'll see that if you look clearly at the context as you go through. Now, why, though, do a lot of people not understand this or not want to believe it? Um... A lot of the times it's because they don't fully understand what it means to be a new creation, okay? Um, because the law was given to the old creation, right? The law was given to the nation of Israel who were in Adam. Um, and so as the law was given to the old creation, 
Okay, if I now, as a new creation, choose to put myself under that law, I'm choosing to identify myself with, with who? With Jesus? Is Jesus under the law? Is Christ under the law? No, I'm not choosing to identify myself with Christ in my experience, right? God identifies me with Christ. But I can choose if I want to live from the source of Adam or the source of Christ, Okay, and so if I'm going to be identifying myself with Adam by saying, well, I'm still this old creation, I'm still under the law, I'm still trying to perform uh, righteousness for God because I don't acknowledge all that God has done for me in Christ. Okay, I am identifying myself with Adam. I'm identifying myself with the old creation, and so I'm going to share Adam's experience. Okay, I'm going to share the experience of the old creation. So that's what we're going to get to in Romans 7. Okay, but I wanted to read with you guys a few verses that we didn't get to, um, that I wanted to get to in Romans 6 about being a new creation. I just have to find them. Where are they? <coughs> <laughs> They're somewhere. Okay. Okay, so you don't have to turn here because you all know it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Right? The old things pass away. All things have become new. So this is true. Okay? If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. Okay? Um, here's another one. Galatians 6.15. says this, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Okay, so understand this. In Galatians, we're talking about circumcision and uncircumcision. We're not just talking about like the physical act, right? We're talking about taking upon oneself the yoke of the law. Okay, that's what circumcision signifies is if a Gentile is choosing to be circumcised, they're saying, I need to follow the law. Okay, it's circumcision was the, the sign of that covenant, the Mosaic covenant. So taking upon yourself the yoke of the law. He says that doesn't do anything as far as producing true spiritual fruit in the Christian life. That doesn't avail anything. Okay, circumcision doesn't avail anything and neither does uncircumcision avail anything only a new creation okay that's the thing okay that's the thing you have to be living in if you're going to produce true spiritual fruit that's the thing because in adam there's no true spiritual fruit to be found there's none there okay so if you're just trying to do it on your own and you're working by this principle of law you're putting on yourself the yoke of the law that's not going to do you any good, and your efforts aren't going to go anywhere. Okay, now let's look at Revelation 3, 14. This is Jesus speaking to the churches. He says to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay, so there Jesus calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. There he is talking about himself as being the beginning of the new creation. Okay, again, when we were talking about um, in chapter 5, us being in Adam... Okay, and how we have been transferred okay, out of Adam's race, and now we have been placed into Christ's race. Okay, now before Adam was our federal head, right? And so everything that was true of Adam, everything that fell to him because of the choice that he made in the garden fell to us. But now we, because we have been united with Christ, okay, we've died out of that realm, okay? So united with Christ in his death means I've died out of Adam's race, okay? I've died out of his realm, and now 
I am united with Christ, also in his resurrection. Okay, and so he is my new federal head. And now I am part of a new race. I am part of the new creation race, God. Uh, John talks about how we must be born again, right? He uses different terminology for the same thing that Paul is talking about here. But the old creation is not going to inherit, right? We, we, he needed to start new. And so right now you are a new creation, but you still have this unredeemed body, right? You still have your same body. You haven't been glorified yet. And guess what's still in there? <laughs> the sin nature, okay? The flesh. The flesh is still in there, okay? So we're going to talk about that today. So Ephesians 4.24 says, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Your new man was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And remember, this is your new identity. The truest thing that God says about that, the truest thing about you is what God says about you. You are a new creation. Your new man is created after the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. Colossians 3.10 says much the same thing. And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Okay. Your new man is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now, in 2 Corinthians, we've talked about this verse in the past, I know, um, where... Paul talks about how as we uh, look at Christ, right, we, um, it's like looking in a glass or in a mirror, okay, in a mirror, and we are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, so our new man is already created after the image of him in righteousness and true holiness, right? But um, we're not fully manifesting that yet. Okay, so First John talks about this as well. First John chapter 3, again, he uses different terminology. He talks about being the need to be born again, which again is, is being... Um, out of Adam's race, right, and born anew, a new creation. And he talks about being born of God or being born ones. In 1 John 3, he uses a, a word that's translated in, in my version, I don't know how it would be in your version, as sons of God. Or No, my version says children of God, but it's a word... That is not the normal word for children. Okay, it's techna, and it means born ones. So he says uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, born ones of God. Okay, and elsewhere in First John, he talks about being born of God. Okay, the one who is born of God. And that is talking about our new man. Okay, he says elsewhere in 1 John that whoever is born of God cannot sin. Okay, the new man, the new nature is created after the image of God in righteousness and true holiness and does not sin. Okay, Paul's going to kind of talk about that in Romans 7 as well. But who I really am now in Christ does not sin sin. Okay, the new creation does not sin. Then he says 
he says this, Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. We are born of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So remember the, the verse that talked about how our new man is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the one who created him in righteousness and true holiness. And Paul talks about as we look on Christ, we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Now John is saying this, we are that now, okay, but it's not yet been manifested or revealed um, what we shall be. But when we actually see him in his fullness, we will be transformed into his image completely in an instant. Okay, we will be transformed completely into his image, both physically, right? We'll have bodies which will be glorified and made to be like his glorious body. And our flesh will no longer be in those bodies, right? We'll have fully redeemed, glorified bodies like his glorious body, and we will not have our flesh anymore. That is not who we truly are anymore, that flesh, okay? That part of us that commits sin is not who we truly are. And we are going to be revealed as who we truly are when we see Jesus face to face. When we see him completely, we will be completely transformed into his image. But right now, okay, right now, as we look on him and depend on him, as we are renewed by knowledge, as we're transformed by the renewing of our minds, as we're looking on Jesus as in a mirror, we are transformed into his image little by little, okay? And what we mean by that is not that you're not that already, okay, but that it's being manifested, okay? Who you are in Christ is being manifested as you see him and know him and walk in him. The life that you have in Jesus Christ can be manifested increasingly as you know Christ more. So I, Paul again says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Okay, so in Romans 8, 28, we talked about this briefly, but we'll actually look at the text. Nope, not 1 Corinthians, dead. Romans 8, 28. Okay, you guys know this verse. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those are, who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified, past tense. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. You are predestined. If you are in Christ, you are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay, and that is what John is talking about in 1 John, that when we see him, we'll be like him. Okay, so you've been, been predestined to that. Um, it is going to happen. And not only is it going to happen, God says in his counsels, it's already done. Okay, yeah. those he justified, he also glorified. Pretty, pretty amazing. But we don't think of ourselves this way. Okay, and, and we tend to not approach our relationship with God in the light of all the grace that he's bestowed on us in Christ Jesus. So this is what we tend to do, is what Paul is going to do in, in Romans chapter 7. Now David, in the Old Testament, 
he had lots of devotion to God, right? And I might never, you know, measure up to the degree of devotion that he had. And yet, David could never say, I am crucified with Christ, right? David could never say, I am a new creation in Christ. David could never say that he is um, a glorified saint. <laughs> okay, David... David couldn't say that he had the life of Christ indwelling him, okay, or that he um, was sharing in the resurrection life of Christ. None of that was true of him, okay? And if we could wrap our minds around what we've been given in Christ, it will change our lives, and we will stop living under the principle of law and start enjoying the grace that has been shown to us in Christ Jesus and truly producing spiritual fruit in the power of his resurrection life. Matthew eleven eleven, Jesus says that of all the sons of born to women ever, okay, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. Okay, but then he says this, I tell you the truth, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, the kingdom of heaven, okay, is not the church, okay? It's a reference to Israel as beneficiaries of the new covenant, okay, that will happen in the future. But the principle is the same. We are on a totally different plane Okay, we are in a totally different realm than those Old Testament saints. So we should not try to be living in the same way that they were living. 1 Timothy 1.9, Curtis talked about this. The law was not made for a righteous man. The law was not given for a man in Christ. It was not intended for one already made righteous in Christ. <coughs> And Galatians 3.12 says this. See, I talk and I turn the wrong way. <laughs> Galatians 3.12. The law is not of faith. Okay? Yet the law is not of faith, but the law says this, the man who does these things shall live by them. Okay? In Deuteronomy, the law says, do this and live. Right? That's the order under law. You do okay, to gain right? The acceptance with God, you doing to um, live, <laughs> but under grace, that is not to be our experience. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I am crucified with Christ. I am risen with him too. I am ascended with him and seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. I have been, as Ephesians 1.3 says, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Peter says that I have everything that I need for life and godliness. So instead of me working for God, it is God providing everything for me. A lot of the times it's not even that we've, we've been thinking. I know for me, it wasn't me thinking like, I'm just going to do this on my own. I thought I have the Holy Spirit now. And so now I'm just supposed to try to do good and ask him to help me out. Right? So it's kind of like this idea of, okay, God, I will give my 50%, right? And then you supply the other 50% that's needed with your Holy Spirit and we'll be good to go. 
Hey, but that's not the Christian life. God doesn't want half your work and half his work. He doesn't want half, you get half the glory and he gets half the glory. Okay, he doesn't want it to be half, half. Okay? He doesn't even want it to be 90, 10. Okay, he wants it to be, he provides everything. You simply appropriate that by faith. Okay, that's what the Christian life is meant to be. But the law is not of faith. And uh, later on in Romans, it says anything not done in faith is sin. Faith and grace are compatible. The law and grace are not compatible. It's true in justification and it's true in sanctification. Okay, we're going to start into our text. I mean, that was all having to do with the text too. So don't get me wrong. It's not like we're just killing time here. Okay, but Romans chapter 7, we're going to actually read it now, you know. So he says, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law. Okay, so now he's talking to Israelites, right? Jewish people formerly under the law. Um, and he says, you who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For, now here he's using an illustration, okay? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is set free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Okay, so the objective is stated again, okay, that we should bear fruit unto God. And again, in Romans 6, when it says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So the point of us being set free from the law is obviously not so we can just be cut loose to do whatever we want, right? It's not um, so that we can cut loose, be cut loose to not do the will of God. Um, the stated objective is we've been released from the law so that we can actually bear fruit to God so that sin will actually not have dominion over us. So, um, we, we don't want to fall into, into that kind of thinking where we're, um, all confused because we're like, well, but I thought I'm supposed to do the will of God. Yes. Okay. Yes. You're supposed to do the will of God, but you're going about it the wrong way. If you're trying to live under the law now, he uses an illustration of a woman who has a husband, okay, but wants to be with another man, right? So in this scenario, the law is the first husband, okay? And we are, or Israelite or whatever, um, is the woman, okay? And the other man is Christ, okay? So in this scenario... Um, if you want to think about the law, the law is like a perfect husband, right? Perfect, holy, righteous, good, all of those things. Okay, the law is. But he demands the same perfection from you, okay? The law demands the same perfection that he has from you, but he doesn't do anything to help you keep his standard, and you don't have the ability to keep it, right? So you're just always failing, right? <laughs> always failing to live up to the demands that he has placed on you. Um, and they're good demands. Again, he's perfect. Remember, the, the law isn't the bad guy here, okay? The problem is with you, okay? The problem is that you aren't perfect, um, far from it, that you are totally unable to keep these standards, but the law, he doesn't do anything to help. He doesn't do anything to help you or lift the burden or make it possible for you as a person who's inadequate to do it, to somehow do it. He doesn't. Okay. But there's this other one. There's this other man, right? And he doesn't have a lower standard. 
Okay. In fact, his standard is higher, but he says, you don't have to do any of the work. I will do it all for you. Okay. So who do you want to be with? <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, but okay. We can't be joined to a different husband. Okay. If we're still under the law. Okay. We, we can't be joined to Christ to do everything through us. If we're still in union with law and we're required to produce righteousness ourselves. <clears throat> so we are in a pickle because the law is not going to die, right? There's, it says uh, that not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law um, till heaven and earth pass away. So the law is not going to die. <laughs> so how are we going to get free from this relationship? Well, through us dying, right? So it's the same way that we were freed from bondage to sin and from that master-slave relationship to sin is through our death with Christ is the same way that we're released from the law. Okay, so he says, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So think, kind of try to picture in your mind that there's this huge gulf okay and the gulf is death okay and the gulf separates two separate kingdoms okay and this kingdom over here on this side is the kingdom of adam okay and the law is in force over there with its demands and its punishments and all of those things and its sentencing of death okay so the law is over there and it's a really gloomy place and nobody keeps the law and it's very bad right but then there's this wonderful kingdom over here and Christ, okay, comes and you've been identified with him in his death and you've passed out of that kingdom, out of that realm. You've gone through the gulf of death and now you've been transferred. You've been joined with him in his resurrection and the two of you are on the other side of death, okay, in this wonderful new realm. That is what we're talking about here that has transpired with us and Christ is we've died out of that realm and now we are in this new realm with Christ. And in this realm, we can actually bear fruit to God because we're not under this law that we're incapable to keep. Now we have the life of the Lord Jesus Okay, and he is our life, and we can look to him to be and perform righteousness in us, but we're not there yet. That's Romans 8. Okay, so um, he says, for when we were in the flesh. Now, in the flesh is a reference to our unsaved days. Okay, rather than being in Christ, okay, positionally, we were in the flesh. He says, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Right? This was our experience in Adam. Okay? We get law, we get the law, and all it does is just arouse our sinful passions even more. And it works itself out in the further experience of wrath and death, and servitude to sin, and separation from the life of God. All of these terrible things that we've talked about that we had in Adam, okay, in Romans chapter 5. So that's what we got um, with the law back then. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We've been delivered from the law. We've died to what we were held by. Now that word there, held, okay, you might have a different word in your translation. But it has the idea of being held back, okay, or being hindered. It's not just the law was like holding you in a cell. It's that the law was holding you back from actually producing fruit, true spiritual fruit. Okay, so as a saved person, the law is a hindrance. Okay, the law is a hindrance to you producing true spiritual fruit. And so you've been delivered from it. 
You've been delivered from it so that you should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. God has a different way for you to walk in righteousness and holiness than the ineffective way that held you back. Okay, and that's what Romans 8 is all about, is serving in the newness of the spirit. Um, but now he's talking about the oldness of the letter, okay? And the way that you shouldn't try to live the Christian life. So he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Okay, is the law like morally bad then? Because it brings out sin, because it arouses sin in us, because it makes us sin worse and it holds us back from producing righteousness? He says, certainly not, right? Heck no, no. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So the law, even though it brings out sin, okay, in us, it is a good thing, okay? It's a good thing because then we see sin for what it is, okay? Because he says here, um, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. I love the example that he chooses to use. One, because a lot of people try to argue that we're not under the civil law. And when Paul's talking about us not being under the law, he's talking about us not being under the civil law and the ceremonial law. Okay, some people like to try to split the law up into three sections. The moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law, right? The laws that are pertaining to the Levitical priesthood, the laws that are pertaining to how life functions in Israel, the nation, and the moral law, or basically the Ten Commandments, okay? Um, and they tried to say, well, we're not free from the moral law. The moral law is still our rule of life. Okay, but we're free from, we're not under the other parts of the law. But the one that Paul chooses is from the moral law. Okay, the one that he chooses to use is from the Ten Commandments. Okay, and he talks about the effect that it has on him as a believer. Okay, now some people, again, are very opposed to the thinking that we're not under the law. And so they try to explain around this. Too, and they try to say, well, this is Paul talking about when he was not saved. Okay, this is Paul talking about when he was an unsaved person. Okay, but look at the things that are said here. He says, apart from the law, this is in verse 8, apart from the law, sin was dead. Can you say that about an unbeliever? That sin is not effectively operating in them? No, you can't ever say that about an unbeliever, okay? Then the next verse, he says, I was alive once without the law. We've already talked about a million times, right, that what we get in Adam is the experience of death, okay? And uh, that death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam sinned. Death is the experience of an unbeliever. For, so for him to be saying, I was alive once without the law, can only be talking about his experience as a believer. Um, then in, he talks about willing to do the law. He talks about agreeing with the law that it's good. Um, he talks about, delighting in the law in verse 22 i delight in the law of god according to the inward man okay so we don't you, these are things that are not said of unbelievers in scripture okay so this is paul talking about and again where are we in romans we're in the sanctification section we're talking about our freedom from bondage that we had in adam and our ability now okay to walk in newness of life that's what we're talking about so that's what he's talking about here. And he's talking about his own personal experience as a believer, okay, trying to keep the commandment, okay, trying to keep the law. And it's a, at some point previously in his Christian life, he's no longer uh, struggling thinking that he needs to keep the law. 
Okay, but at a point previous in his Christian life, he went through this struggle that he talks about in Romans chapter 7. And he uses his own personal struggle to teach doctrine. And I think it's a really effective way to do it. And I like that he did it this way. Okay, because we can relate to what he says, right? We can relate to this struggle. He says, I would have not known covetousness unless the Lord said, you shall not covet. Now, covetousness is, is one of those inward ones, right? That we're not as quick to notice that we are doing, okay? So it's a great example for this. As he says, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have realized my sin unless the law had said you shall not covet. Now, the law says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, right? Or your neighbor's house or your neighbor's manservants or maidservants or anything that belongs to your neighbor anything and we should understand this if we tend to think oh it's only about possessions covetousness is me wanting anything that's not mine right me wanting anything that doesn't belong to me um that's covetousness so for instance you know if i see that christina is you know really good at organizing and that she's, you know, she's got that personality type where she can multitask like I can't. And she gets a whole bunch of stuff done um, in the time that it takes me to do one thing. Um, and, and if I see, you know, that, that Christina, she just has, you know, this knack for like keeping all these little uh, details in her brain so she can like plan events and stuff like that. And she won't miss things. And, she, you know, it's just, it'll run smoothly. I'm like me. And, and if I think, you know, in my, in my head and in my heart, why can't I have that? Right. I wish I could be like that. I wish I could have that spiritual gift. Okay. That's covetousness, right? Now we all think thoughts like that all the time. Okay. Because of the flesh, because that's what the flesh is like. The flesh is covetous, okay? And so we think thoughts like that. And maybe because we're so accustomed to thinking those things and because they don't come out in any outward way for anyone else to see or for us to see in living color, okay, we don't really notice them that much. We don't really think anything of them, okay? But then we, when we have God revealing it to us, right? whether by his word in the law or whether by him revealing it to us, revealing our sin to us through his Holy Spirit in our minds. Okay, he uses the law, right? And he shows us this is sin. Okay, so now I have a moral directive from God that I know this is sin. I know this is not righteous, right? Okay, so it shows me my sin. Okay, and then he says, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead or not operating effectively. Okay, that's kind of review. But when again, when we talk about dead in scripture, we're not talking about being eradicated or anything like that. But it was dead in that it was not operating effectively. Okay, to produce sin in me. Um, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, so here he is, you know, going along in his walk with Christ and he is living a lot. He's, he's experiencing that eternal life. Okay. He's experiencing the life of Christ. He's walking by faith. He's walking in the spirit. He's in fellowship with God. And then he sees the commandment. You shall not covet. Okay. And he realizes his sin. Okay. And he says, I'm going to try to keep this commandment. Boom, death. <laughs> Sorry, Jody. <laughs> I scared Jody. Okay, so um, 
yeah, what happens when he sees the commandment and then says, well, I'm going to try to keep it, okay? I'm going to try to do it, is that sin now, because he has said, I'm going to try to do it, okay? Not out loud, okay? But in his heart, he's like, I should try to keep this law. I should try to stop coveting, right? Well, what happens is that he gets no victory in that. On the contrary, sin actually takes advantage of him through the commandment to produce in him all manner of evil desires. Okay, that might sound confusing to you. Let me just give you a little picture of this that you all can probably relate to. Okay, especially if you work with children or have children. Okay, so let's say that there's wet paint on this wall, right? Mm -hmm. And your child didn't even know there was wet paint. They weren't even interested in that wall. But all of a sudden you say, listen, there's wet paint on that wall, so you can't touch it. Do not touch the wall, okay? Okay, Tell, say okay so I know you're listening, right? And then you put up the caution tape, right? And you've got a big sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. And, but your, what is your child? <sighs> I have to touch that wall. Like, right? They weren't even interested in the wall before. Like, who cares? It's just a wall. But because you told them not to touch it. Like, oh, I got to touch the wall. It's like drawing them, right, to touch the wall got to defy authority, right? That is the flesh, okay? But then there's the other kind of fleshly person, okay? Like me, this morning Katie was like, like Myla, or I was like, like Mia, right? Okay, so Hudson goes up, right, and touches the paint, obviously. So Hudson runs over and he touches the paint and he's like smearing his hands all over it and going like this and putting it in his hair and like putting it on the floor. And he's doing that. And uh, Mia's watching all of this, right? And she's like, Hudson, you're not supposed to, to touch the wall. And then mom comes up, right? And mom is like, Hudson, I told you not to touch the paint. And Mia, she would go, I didn't touch the paint. I I would never touch the paint. <laughs> right? Okay, this is what the law brings. This is what the law brings inevitably is one of two things, either outright disobedience or self-righteousness. Okay, that is what the law inevitably brings. If you try to do something, okay, According to the law, you're like setting your mind to, I am going to obey it. That's what's going to come. You aren't going to be able to escape from it. We've talked about this before, okay? But you, you'll see it in your kids and it's hard for you to see it in yourself, okay? Until God starts to show it to you. You'll think, what's wrong with my children? I've told them not to do this 50,000 times. What's wrong with them? Why can't they get it? Why can't they stop doing it? What's wrong with them is the same thing that's wrong with you. Okay, the same reason why you keep struggling with the same sins over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, it's called the flesh. <laughs> and your flesh will never change. It will never get better. It will never improve. It will never diminish. It will never stop being there. Okay, you will never not have temptation anymore. You will never, ever, ever, okay, have your flesh be nicer. It's, it's not ever going to get pretty. Um, who... You were in Adam and the sin nature that you inherited from him doesn't improve and doesn't get better. And that's why God said that we needed to be put to death, right? We needed to die out of that realm, okay? Because that old creation is incapable of producing true righteousness. That's why Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. What does he mean? That you can't breathe? No, he means you can't do anything spiritually fruitful. Not true righteousness. You can't do it. Okay, so he sets his mind to try to keep the commandment. Do not covet. So you could try this. You know, you could do this experiment. God doesn't want you to. I'm just saying. <laughs> you could say, okay, I'm going to try not to covet all week. Right. I'm, I'm not going to see someone's appearance and be like, I wish I had, you know, her hair. 
I am not going to um, look at someone else's husband like cleaning up all their dishes and doing all this stuff and be like, I wish my husband would do that. I'm not going to do it. I, every time, you know, I see somebody who has a skill that I do not have, I am not, I'm not going to wish that I had that skill. Okay. You, you just go ahead and try. Why don't you? Okay. Why don't you try for a week not to covet? Okay. You're not going to, you're not going to succeed. <laughs> okay. But this is what we do. And we think we can, we think, okay, you know, going to get my devotional book out. My devotional book is going to remind me that I need to be patient. Right. And so, <clears throat> my crazy children like I just need just count to three and breathe and you know like make sure that I'm calmed down first of all if you're <laughs> if you have to calm down you're already not patient okay but <laughs> like okay yes I need to exercise patience and so we think I can do it right I can exercise patience so I just need to be reminded to be patient and then maybe I'll pray and ask God to help me be patient Right, and uh, then are you gonna be successful? No, you're not gonna be successful, okay? And then the minute you are a little bit successful outwardly, that you've asserted your willpower or whatever, it's like Mia sitting there watching Hudson and saying, I didn't touch the paint, right? I didn't touch it. I would never touch the paint. And every time we feel this way towards someone else, right, this, this thing of, can't believe my husband did that. I would never do that. Right? We're forgetting something. <laughs> We're all made of the same cookie dough. <laughs> and your flesh might express itself in different ways, but it's the same flesh from Adam. It is. Okay, so he says that sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in him all manner of evil desire. Okay, apart from the law, sin was dead. He was alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and he died. Okay, now died, again, here we're not talking about him dropping dead physically. Obviously, we're not talking about that. Okay, obviously, we're not talking about him um, dying eternally either. We are talking about that experience of eternal life, that experience of abundant life in Christ, okay, coming to a stop. Okay, coming to a stop during this time okay so when we're trying to do it ourselves we are not depending on Christ to live through us we're not experiencing his life okay when we're trying to do it ourselves it, it's a lot of people think of like the Holy Spirit in us and and Christ in us as kind of like this osmosis thing right that I don't even need to be thinking about that I just need to be trying to do good things as a saved person. And then like the life of Christ is just going to like seep out through me. It's going to be amazing. That's not how it works. <laughs> okay. That wouldn't be walking by faith. Okay. That would be walking by experience, right? Because it would just be coming out of you. Just be like, I'm going to, you know, try not to covet. And then when you try not to covet, it would just be successful, right? But that's not how it is, is it? <laughs> it's not like that. Okay, because we walk by faith and because it's not 50-50. It's not you trying to do it and then God supplies the rest. That's not how God designed the Christian life. Okay, and he's not, it's not how God designed the new creation to live. So, instead of experiencing uh, that life of Christ, he is experiencing the death that was his in Adam. That loss of fellowship with God... He is experiencing the control of sin. Okay, he's experiencing the control of sin. And we'll see that a little bit more here. So, he says the commandment which was intended to bring life, he found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Now, this is what sin does, okay, when we see law. Law is very appealing to our flesh, okay, very appealing to self-righteous flesh, I should say, okay, because our pride says, I can do it, right? You've seen, uh, now this is especially true of, of guys, you know, but for one example, right, if you, 
you're always told to ask a woman for directions, right? Because if you ask a guy for directions, he'll just pretend that he knows where he's going. But really, if you are have um, a huge boulder, okay, and and there's a bunch of guys who are walking by it, and someone's like, I need this boulder moved. Okay, even a guy who knows he can't lift that boulder is going to be like, yeah, I'll try. You know, there. that's just how we are, okay? And self, <laughs> self-righteous flesh is like, yeah, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Right? Israel is like, okay, everything that the Lord has said we will do. Self-righteous flesh likes law okay and that's why you will find yourself being drawn back into it time and time again for a while until these truths really settle in and your mind is being renewed by them because your flesh deceives you okay sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me your flesh will not reveal to you its true nature okay that has to be revealed by God. And that's why we've got to be in the word. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our hearts try to tell us that we can produce righteousness, right? Our flesh tries to say, well, and I'm good enough to do this. Like, just tell me what to do and I will perform it. I can do good for you, God. But it is deceiving us right and by deceiving us it kills us or it terminates for the time being okay our experience of life that eternal life in christ that abundant life that we have in him his resurrection life we're no longer experiencing that as believers when we are trying to live by the law he says, therefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Did God give us this thing, you know, just to slay us, um, just to bring us down? He says, certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. See, when the law shows us the true nature of our flesh and our actual inability, okay, when it shows us that our flesh is truly evil, when it show when the law shows us that we can't do anything apart from Christ, okay, when the law shows us our true sinfulness, then it is doing us a favor, right? This is doing us a good thing, okay? Because the longer we're kept in the dark on this, the longer we think we can actually produce righteousness, the longer we'll try and the longer we'll set aside the grace of God and the longer we'll not experience the abundant life we've been given in Christ. We'll just keep trying to perform for God. We'll just keep trying to be righteous for him. So sin made, uh, law, the law made it clear to him that sin was exceedingly sinful. He was able to see it for what it was. See, again, if you have just this law, um, or if you have the sin of covetousness, okay, you might not really recognize it as such a big deal okay but then if you have the law of god right written on tablets of stone and it said that this is sin right that this is breaking god's law and it's deserving of death and all of that jazz okay well then it's exceedingly sinful because now you're sinning against the revealed word of god right so we have that situation there um, where the law helps us to see sin for the exceedingly sinful thing that it is, okay? And that it becomes more sinful because it's against what God has said and what we've seen that he said. So in, in my life, for instance, um, God started revealing to me the sin in my heart of 
pride, okay? And that I couldn't do anything like that I thought I was doing in service to him. Um, you know, I couldn't, you know, sing uh, in church. I couldn't pray in a prayer meeting. I couldn't answer a question in class. I couldn't teach. I couldn't do anything without some pride being in my heart there. Okay, without thinking about somebody's opinion of me or without thinking, I hope so-and-so notices me or I hope so-and-so thinks that, you know, I'm spiritual or so-and-so doesn't think negatively of me right now or whatever. Like, I could not get away from that. And boy, did I try. <laughs> okay, once it was revealed as sin to me, okay, once I knew because God had revealed it to me and convicted me of sin, Okay, through his word, um, through seeing his holiness, through his Holy Spirit showing me this is sin. Okay, I didn't have the truth yet to be able to walk in victory because I didn't know I had it. So at that point, realizing that I was in sin, okay, that I was acting in sinful ways, I wanted to stop, right? So I decided I was going to try to stop. And it was so discouraging <laughs> to find out I couldn't stop. I could not get those thoughts out of my head. Okay? I could not stop thinking about other people's opinion of me, no matter how hard I tried. But that was good. It was good for me. It felt very painful at the time because I still had some hope in myself. I still had some faith in myself that I could perform for God, right? And it was all being torn down and being torn apart. And I thought, I can't do one good thing. I can't do one thing without some form of pride or selfishness entering into my mind and heart. I was so disappointed with myself. <laughs> but we have to get to a point of not just disappointment with ourselves. We need to get to a point of complete despair of ourselves. We need to get to a point of complete distrust of ourselves, complete acknowledgement of our incapability to do righteousness before we will be ready for the good news of what we've been given in Christ and before we will actually want that victory that he's given us in the way that he has given it to us. And so this is what happens with Paul as well. I relate so much to what he says in this chapter because I feel it was my experience. And maybe you can relate too. Maybe you're going through Romans 7 right now. I don't know. <laughs> but he says, um, I know or we know that the law is spiritual, right? It's given by God. And it's a good thing, but I am carnal. Okay, now here he's talking about himself, not as like who he is as a new creation in Christ, but himself apart from Christ. Okay, so just of himself, he says, I am carnal or I am fleshly, sold under sin. Again, under its control, under its bondage. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Or another uh, way that you could understand this statement is, I don't know what I am accomplishing. All of my efforts are futile. All of my efforts are coming to nothing. I'm not accomplishing anything. He says this, for what I will to do. Now here the word will, okay, is more than just a desire, okay, in the Greek. It's more than just like I desire to do this. It's actually an active engagement of his will. Okay, so he's bringing his willpower to bear here. And that's how many Christians try to live the Christian life. 
is through their willpower. He says, what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So he's, he's frustrated, okay, at this point in his Christian experience. Again, he's, he's telling us about what it was like for him in the past when he was trying to obey the commands of God, of himself. <coughs> and even though he wanted to, okay, and he willed to, and he brought his willpower to bear on it, he couldn't carry it out. He couldn't practice it. Instead of that, he did the things he hated doing. And I know I've had that experience. <laughs> not only in thinking thoughts that I did not want to be thinking, but in reacting towards my children in ways that I did not want to react towards them in. And other things, okay? But that experience of trying and striving and wanting and willing and yet having no success, no victory. He says, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Okay. This verse is kind of crazy. Okay, because we do not think of ourselves the way God thinks about us. Okay, but here Paul is. Okay, he's saying this is the thing. Who I am now in Christ. Okay, my new man. Okay, he's going to say later on, I delight in the law of God in, in my inward man. Okay, I agree with the law of God that it's good. I delight in it, in my inward man. Okay? My new man delights in the things of God. Okay, And so I see his moral absolutes that are he had given to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And I'm like, yes, this is wonderful. This is pure. This is good. Right? But then I can't, I can't actually perform it. Okay? The power to carry it out, I don't find. And... I do the opposite, okay? I actually do the opposite of what I wanted to do. The thing that I hate, that's what I do. So this is what he's saying. If I, in my inward man, okay, in my new man, don't want to do these things, okay, do not want to sin, and yet that's what is being produced in me, it's not me doing it, okay? It's not who I truly am. It's not my true identity. My new creation man, okay, who I really am, is not the one doing it. It's sin that dwells in me. Okay, it's the flesh. Sin that dwells in me. That's kind of crazy. If we could really think that way. If we could really think, I am a saint. I am a new creation. The true me, who I really am in Christ, doesn't sin. <laughs> wow. But that's not how we think, is it? We have to have our minds renewed. Okay? And this is such a big deal to him that he repeats it again. Okay? A second time. So we'll see that. He says, um, for I know that in me, and then he says, that is in my flesh. Okay? So now he's, he's differentiating Okay, the new man with the flesh. saying He's saying, in me, that is in my flesh, okay, in that sin nature, in that old source of life, nothing good dwells. In me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. I want to do it, 
but I don't know how. I can't find the how. I don't have the power to carry it out in myself. These are good realizations, okay, that we all need to come to too. It says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So again, this is such a big realization to him that he repeats it two times. If I will not to do it, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now in verse 21, he says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, so um, we talked about in hermeneutics last year how there's different ways that the word law can be used. The law can be uh, used in several different ways. One, to talk about the law of Moses, which is how it's been being used um, previously in this chapter. Okay, it can also refer to the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. It can also be referring to the whole Old Testament. And it can also be referring to a principle of operation, like the law of gravity. Okay, so the law of gravity is a principle of operation. It always holds true. It brings the same inevitable results, right? Invariable. Um, always what you throw up comes down. Right, what goes up must come down. So the law of gravity is a principle of operation and that's how he's using this here. But I see another law in my members worrying against the law of my mind. <coughs> the law in his members where he says, in my flesh, okay. Now again, the body is our unredeemed body is where our flesh resides and finds expression. And in our members, there is this law, okay? In our bodies, there is this law that wars against the law of our mind or our inward new man desires that we now have, okay? Our new creation desires that we now have that align with the Lord, align with the things of God, align with the revealed will of God, um, they are warring against each other, okay? And in Galatians, it also talks about how the flesh, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you do not do what you want. Okay, so our new creation man is a slave of, sin, of righteousness, right? We talked about that back in Romans 6. Our new man, who we are, our new position now, we are slaves of righteousness. And we have those desires, okay, that we long to do good. But then we also have these warring desires, okay, of the flesh. And we have this warring principle of operation within us that when we set our minds to do good evil is present in me he says he says i see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members Okay, I find that a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. So even though his desire is to do good, evil is present with me. And what he says there, evil is present with me, it's like evil is close at hand. Evil is really easy to do, okay? Evil is really easy to do. It's right there. It's close at hand. It's really easy to do. He delights in, in the law of God according to his inward man, but there's another law in his body that's waging war against that 
law in his mind and bring him into captivity to the law of sin that's in his members. The flesh wins out against our willpower and against our desires. Okay? So if you pit your mind, okay, your your desires of your new man, if you pit your mind and your willpower against the flesh, the flesh will win. Okay? The flesh will win out. And that is why you cannot do what you want to do. Okay? This is a law, a principle of operation that always is invariably true. That when you set your mind to do righteousness, okay, as of yourself, the law of sin, which is in your members, okay, will win out over your will, over your desires, over your best efforts and intentions, the law of sin, which is in your members, will bring you into captivity. Okay? The law in your members will bring you into captivity to the law of sin. Now, what is the law of sin? Okay. Now, here we're talking again about bondage, right? This is the same thing that he's been talking about all throughout Romans. <coughs> is even, you know, we talked in Romans 6 about a believer choosing to sin, right? And subjecting themselves to bondage. But now we've got a believer who wants to do good. Now we've got a believer who wants to please God. Now we've got a believer who wants to perform righteousness for God. Now we've got a believer who wants to do the law and obey a commandment. Okay? And he's finding the same experience as the believer who's choosing sin. Bondage. Okay? He's being brought back into captivity to the law of sin. Uh, now we were kind of... He's been leading up to this. So we were kind of, you know, warned about this already. So in Romans chapter 4, I know we're, we're going a little bit long. Um, but in Romans chapter 4, he says in verse 15, the law brings about wrath. The law brings about wrath. And the wrath that we're talking about here is the wrath that we've been talking about all throughout Romans Romans chapter 1, three times he talks about how the wrath of God is being manifested now in turning man over to increased control of their own sinful lusts, right? Handing man over to the control of sin. And in chapter 5 where he says, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. Okay, the law came in so that sin might abound. And he talks about, again, that wrath, but he uses a different word, okay, in Romans chapter 5. He uses the word katakrava, okay? We said that that's the word that's being translated condemnation here, but that this is a specific word used for condemnation. It's only used three times in the, the New Testament, and each time it's used in Romans, okay? Two times in Romans 5 and one time in Romans 8. Okay, now in Romans 5, it is used to um, talk about the judgment that came to all men resulting in condemnation from the one sinful act of Adam. Okay, so from Adam, we all received this judgment that was handed down that resulted in the katakrama okay this condemnation is a sentence of servitude imposed for a crime so for the crime of adam the punishment imposed 
was servitude to sin. Okay, we talked about that. And the experience of death, right? The day that you eat of this, you will surely die. That experience of death being cut off from the life of God and only able to produce sin. He was put under servitude to sin. And in Romans 5, it talks about us in Adam being constituted sinners, right? So this wrath, okay, that we've been talking about that the law brings is the inevitable result, even in the life of a believer. The law brings about wrath. When you choose to try to keep the righteous standards God requires of yourself, when you set yourself up to do it, when you set your willpower up against the flesh, you put yourself back under bondage. And you are no longer experiencing that life. This law of sin this captivity which brings us back under that is a reference to that experience okay, that was ours and Adam. The law of sin that is in our members is that control of sin okay, into which we are brought back into captivity when we attempt to keep the law of ourselves and here he comes to a point where he recognizes all of this is true of him in my flesh dwells no good thing i want to do what is good but i can't carry it out and no matter how hard i try i find a law that when i will to do good evil is present with me that even though i delight in the law of god in my inward man there's this other law that's always operating in my members and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin in my members. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So he gets to a point of complete despair of himself and he stops trying to do it. And he looks outside himself and says, who will deliver me from the body of this death or this body of death? He recognizes that he cannot do it and he cannot deliver himself no matter how hard he tries. The law always brings this one inevitable result. The experience of servitude to sin. The experience of death. So, we will get to the triumphant, awesome, great news of the very end of Romans 7 and the beginning of Romans 8 next time. Okay, sorry we went over.